All right, thank you so much for, for the invitation, Jay, and for everybody who supports the Austin Forum. It's great to be here. I've had the, the chance to join a bunch of the, uh, the online versions, and it's great to be here in person as well. So just, you know, I've tried to choose content tonight. This could be a variety of different levels, whether you're familiar, you're an AI or machine learning practitioner, or you're just interested in, in, in learning about it now for the first time. So there'll be hopefully plenty of things for, for both uh, sets of folks or you know, anyone who's in there in the middle. So the, the idea was to really talk about, uh, to give some introductory information about AI and machine learning, provide some background terminology and so forth, some AI fundamentals, just so you kind of know the, the, land, the lay of the land there and then talk about some use cases where either AI and machine learning are working very, very well currently, or they, they have the potential to very soon. But then I think it's really, really important to be aware of the, the risks and the perils, and that's the, that section of the talk. And then, of course, have lots of uh, resources to share. Just so you know, we'll have some videos towards the, towards the end of the, uh, of the talk. Uh, have some really, really interesting examples. Literally, it was so challenging to choose things. Uh, there are examples that we'll be talking about tonight where it, the research was published like just last week. So things have really, really uh, progressed very quickly. I do want to, to call it a bunch of really cool events that are available this, starting this week in terms of data and AI. There's data.world's uh, summit that actually uh, starts tomorrow. That's three. I'm, uh, I've been very fortunate to be on their board of technical advisors uh, since 2016. Uh, there's the UT Austin Good System Symposium. That one is actually uh, in person on campus. Um, and so that will be a tremendous event as well. Um, on, also on the 7th, uh, tomorrow morning, there'll be an MLOps meetup. And uh, some of my Kung Fu AI friends and colleagues will be speaking at that. So if you're interested in machine learning operations, it'll be a good one to tune in for. Uh, Ray RL is uh, re uh, reinforcement learning and production. If you're interested in more of the, the deep learning frameworks that, that are current today, that's a good one to consider. And then obviously on the 15th, as part of the Austin Forum uh, AI month, there's going to be an in-person. Is that hybrid or just in-person, Jay? Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so you'll hear more about that. That one is in-person. Uh, about Kung Fu AI, so we do uh, AI machine learning consulting, uh, really, really uh, amazing team. I feel very uh, proud and fortunate to be part of it. We've done a lot of work uh, on the commercial side for, gosh, more than 50 projects now, primarily in the commercial space, but also now more recently for the government with works, uh, uh, projects for DARPA and DIU or the Defense Innovation Unit. And so I'm really proud to be part of that. Folks who joined um, Kung Fu have come from a lot of the big uh, tech uh, companies, you know, SpaceX, Google, uh, Expedia, AWS. And so the nice thing is we can really uh, uh, make the best use of that kind of expertise. Uh, broadly, what we focus on are three areas, strategy, basically helping uh, companies figure out how to move into AI and machine learning, engineering, which is actually building uh, full solutions, and then transformation. So if companies want to learn how to do the, the, the kind of AI and machine learning tasks to do that in-house, we can help them do that. Uh, so when I joined in January 2020, we were 18 people, and I think we're just shy of 40 people now. And so it's really cool to be part of, uh, a part of this growing team. All right. So by my background, so I'm a, my, I did my PhD in physics back in the early 90s in the Center for Nonlinear Dynamics at UT Austin with a, a focus on a chaos theory. I really, really had a fun time doing that. I was born and raised in Los Alamos, New Mexico. So if, if you know, the, the joke then was, uh, do you grow, did you gl glow at night? <laughs> or the national lab was there. Um, and then after that, I actually... I um, started my own little solo uh, data science company called Paragon Science, and really, really enjoyed that, getting to wear all the hats. But I have to say now being part of Kung Fu has been awesome because it's great to be have that entrepreneurial spirit, but within, within the context of a, a great uh, startup. So, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Kung Fu, as you'll, you'll find out later on, has a big AI for good uh, effort. And so it's, it's part of that that allows me the time to work on this stuff. So just to, 
talk about some terminology to start out artificial intelligence, uh, what you think of. So basically the, the idea is to build these systems that can perform some tasks that humans normally have to do. And of course you, you might've heard of the, uh, the phrase of AGI or artificial general intelligence, which of course we know, we know does not exist right now. So all the kinds of AI examples, AI systems we'll be talking about tonight or what we would call narrow AI solutions. Machine learning is a subset of AI where basically the idea is you have systems and methods where you provide data and then the, the algorithms perform better over time. And then deep learning is a subset of uh, machine learning where you, we have artificial neural networks. For deep learning, the idea is that there are multiple layers of the neural nets. And those can be trained on typically very large amounts of data, but then can do amazing, amazing things as we'll see tonight. So this kind of just recaps that sort of hierarchy where AI is the, is the broadest category, machine learning being a subset, and then deep learning is a subset within that. Um, and then a lot of times when you're just starting to get into machine learning, you'll hear these different categories, supervised learning, unsupervised, uh, so let's start with those two first. So supervised learning basically is where you have some ground truth information, like you're showing a system where you want to be able to distinguish cats from dogs. So you show the system examples of cats, examples of dogs, and those ground truth examples are used to train the system. And then later on, a test data comes in and the, the system has to say, is this a cat or is this a dog? And so you see there are a bunch of different traditional kinds of classical machine learning approaches that we've listed there. So unsupervised learning is basically trying to discover just looking at a set of data where we don't know, we don't have any, any information about it. The idea is what can we discover? So you're trying to extract, you know, clusters of information. You're trying to either trends or kind of similarities. And then semi-supervised is kind of like both of those put together. We have some labeled examples and we have a lot of, typically a lot of unlabeled data, but we wanna to try to use those together at the same time. And uh, finally, reinforcement learning is, uh, is a really interesting uh, field, a set of techniques where we basically have an agent that wants to uh, meet some goal. There's a re typically a reward function and it's acting within an environment. And basically the agent is going to try different things. We're gonna give it feedback to see how well it does. And over time, that's gonna involve, that will evolve. And uh, that kind of approach is very, very useful in, for example, like a lot of the supply chain optimization problems. So those are the kind of the broad um, sets of categories that you might hear when you start moving into or learning about machine learning. Uh, I won't go into detail for this slide, but the idea is, the great thing is, gosh, well, compared to when I started moving into science and math, there's just way more, there are many, many more resources uh, that are available now online. So Scikit-Learn is a very typical uh, machine learning package, and they have some the cool things, because obviously when you're just starting into machine learning, what algorithm do I use? And so they have a little cheat sheet here to kind of guide you that process. So we'll be making the slides all available at the end. So the idea here is don't worry about understanding the slide now, it'll be available for you uh, if you wanna look at it later on. So why now? <laughs> so why now? So what, what are the kind of key uh, changes that have happened recently? Well, in terms of computation, uh, CPUs or central processing units, uh, sort of the growth in a processing power kind of plateaued uh, basically around you know, 2005 or so. So not much growth that was, further growth that was available. And so the biggest change here came from the, uh, the introduction of GPUs. And so these graphical processing units, which uh, if you're familiar with the video gaming, and I know a lot of folks here, <laughs> I was like, my husband is definitely a, a huge gamer. <laughs> so he can tell you about those. And the idea is that uh, those GPO processors are like super, super ideal for matrix operations, which are really, really at the heart of many, many um, of the AI and machine learning uh, techniques that we'll talk about. Um, I do want to give a shout out to my uh, dear friend and one of our advisors, Paco Nathan. Uh, he kindly made a bunch of his slides, and he's a, a, definitely a huge expert in this area. But once again, there are just tons of new 
uh, techniques, new frameworks that are really meant to take advantage of the, the awesome new hardware that's available. And then this slide just kind of shows how time has gone on. And interestingly enough, when I first met Jay, you, Jay, you were uh, at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. This is back what was like probably early to the 90s, something like that. And that was kind of that area of the MPI, the multiprocessing uh, phase. In the 2000s, we, you might hear of Hadoop and Spark, uh, those, those frameworks that were used a lot in, in when deep learning was trying to take off. And then now there are even more uh, powerful frameworks. So Ray is another current one that you might hear of. So one of the other ingredients, obviously, if we talked about before with those examples of supervised and semi-supervised learning, you actually need to have data in order to train the systems. And so really, we, what we've seen is that by the availability of more and more uh, examples to train these systems, that's where we can take advantage of these new deep learning algorithms. Another key ingredient here is the fact that a lot of these big companies, the Microsoft, the uh, Facebook, well now Meta, um, may have made open source frameworks available and, for free. And so that has been, that has tremendously spurred the growth of many, many areas of AI and machine learning. And so here just is just one, one plot that shows the popularity. So GitHub is a, is, is a very common source code control and, and publication uh, website if you're not familiar with that. But the idea is when you use a package you really, uh, really like, you'll give it a star, it's kind of like liking something on Facebook. And it just shows that that TensorFlow there at the top is just the most popular one, but they're strong, strong growth uh, in some of these other deep learning frameworks. And so the final ingredient here is comes in uh, the, in the frame of algorithm uh, advantage advances. So deep neural nets basically have a huge amount of learning capacity. That is, um, when you show it enough examples of data, it can automatically discern the relevant features in the data. So for example, as a person, when we look at a picture of a cat or a dog, we can, we can frequently tell, there are some examples that, I, <laughs> that uh, one of my friends and coworkers showed us that, that kind of stumped us like, well, we thought it was a cat, but it was really a dog. But we don't necessarily know specifically what, how our brain makes those decisions. In a similar fashion, neural networks can, when you provide enough information, can learn to uh, figure out what those features are. So this kind of, this uh, diagram shows the, the typical structure, a little bit simplified here. The idea is we have a bunch of training data. Um, We don't want to adjust all the parameters of the deep learning system in order to come back with a better propagation and better results the next time. And this typically happens over, we, we talk about in deep learning, the, the idea of epochs of training. Every time we do another uh, estimation round, we correct, we go back, back propagate and do that again. And in many cases, uh, some of these large systems, it might take, uh, in some cases, might take days, multiple epochs to go to converge quickly, but that's the that's the high level uh, idea for deep learning framework. <clears throat> so I just want to give a, a little background on some typical things that you might hear of in in deep learning. One is a CNN or convolutional neural networks, and these are really set up for spatial information. So when you, the key example to thinking of it would be images, all right. And the idea is we'll, we're going to stack these different layers within a CNN. And typically what we find is that the different layers will be able to, to find different characteristics. So maybe some part of a, 
one layer with the network will find edges, right? And then other layers will find other kinds of information. What we tend, what we tend to see is that the later layers get more fine-grained or my, more class-specific or problem-specific information. And then finally, once we, we typically have a, a fully connected layer at the end and then an output layer. So in this case, this would be a good example for where there are three, three uh, kind of output classes. So we're trying to distinguish hot, uh, cats from dogs, from birds, for example. So those are CNNs. So think about images or spatial information. So RNNs are recurrent neural networks. The idea of recurrence makes you think of looping, right? So think about sequential information. Think about uh, time series or language because we say words and sentence in particular order to, in order to make sense. So time series, language, sounds, all would, would be um, very uh, amenable to RNNs. So CNNs, spatial, RNNs, se sequential data. Um, and what we see over time is that that these uh, these types of neural networks have done really, really well. So these plots are of error rates. So the lower is better in this case. And the, the yellow line here represents human performance. And we see as on the left, figure nine there is for image recognition. And once deep learning was introduced about 2011, things got better and better because the error rate went down. And so basically by the time we reached 2015, Deep neural networks were basically as good as humans at uh, doing many kinds of image recognition. Uh, the same thing, on the, the example on the right is for speak, speech recognition. So sometimes if you're trying to talk to Alexa or <laughs> Siri, you might disagree, but, um, but generally things have gotten better. So transformers, but not the films. <laughs> uh, so transformers really, well, they did that. They transformed the, 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 the nature of the landscape. So this, uh, this paper came out uh, in 2017. It was called Attention is All You Need. And the idea, uh, the idea of attention that we'll, that we'll try to get to here is about attending to or, or giving weight to specific parts of the sequence of examples. Uh, it was originally geared towards natural language processing or uh, documents. Um, but since then, so it came out in 2017. I don't know if you can see it, but it's been cited by 39,000 research papers. <laughs> so it has totally exploded. And the idea here with transformers just at a high level is we're gonna encode a representation where the encoder, the encoded version is, is able to figure out, okay, what parts of the words or the sentence contributed to later parts of the sentence or the sequence. And then the second part is decoding. We're gonna to try to, uh, you know, given an input, decode to see what, what the prediction would be. So anyway, uh, uh, that's the high level view. Uh, an interesting example here is for machine translation. So basically, well, I'll just kind of read this. The transformer model can visualize what are the parts of a sentence the network attends to you know, gives weight to basically when processing or translating a given word, thus getting insights to how information travels through the network. And you'll see later on, this is a super, super powerful idea. In fact, even though these were originally invented for NLP case, uh, use cases, recently it's been adapted also to computer vision. And right now it's doing, made, there's an ongoing battle that I'll tell you about in just a little bit. So, but here's the example that's on this slide. It's really cool. So this is for translating from English to French. And the, 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 the first sentence is the animal didn't cross the tree, street because it was too tired. And so in French, l'animal n'est pas traversé la rue parce qu'il était trop fatigué. So the, the idea here is when you translate, you have to know in French, you have to know, is it masculine or feminine? All right, so that is kind of what you see then on, in the upper figure of the left. So the transformer architecture is able to actually go through and as you move, after you encode, you, you show the, the, the model lots and lots of examples of how sentences work in English and then in French, it is able to discern which sentences, which words, when you get to that part of the sentence, when you get to the it word, what's most important. So it is able to figure out that it, in that case, refers to the animal and not to the street. 
Does that make sense? Okay. Then the second example, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too wide. Okay. So now what does it refer to in that case? Well, in that case, we know that it refers to what? To the street, right? In that case, elle était trop. And that's the example then on the right side. And because we've shown enough examples, both in English and in French, when you present that, that, uh, that this new test sentence, it's able to figure out that, oh, well, it really should be it in the feminine form. So that's just an example. So once again, when you think about attention, the idea is being able to discern when you are showing, after training the model, when you showed a new sequence, it's able to, to tell you uh, to give to use the information to figure out what's the what are the most important pieces in order to come correct with the in this case with the correct translation and of course there are all kinds of different transformer models the that original uh, diagram that i showed you there was encoding there was decoding but it turns out there are just lots of variations some use only the encoder part so if you might hear the cool thing of these <laughs> these a lot of these deep learning models is that is that uh, the researchers come up with really funny names, uh, clever names. Bert, you know, Camembert. Camembert is actually the French version of Bert. Um, so, uh, transform XLXLNet, um, and then on the right side you see uh, some ones that include both uh, encoder and decoder. So this slide is a, for a, probably more of interest to folks who um, you know who are like more solidly already into transformers, but if you want to refer to this later on, uh, it might be a, a helpful example. Okay, GANs. So we've talked about CNNs, RNNs, we've talked about transformers. So GANs are uh, basically thinking about, a GAN is like basically a generative adversarial network. We have two models that are essentially trying to fight against each other. So the generator, we have some, we have some typical source data but we have some uh, a, source, a source of noise. And the idea for the generator, the generator wants to try to fool the discriminator, All right? So you, maybe we have, you'll see later on, a picture of a person, and we want to generate a, a modified version of a person, All right? And we want to try to fool the discriminator. And the discriminator, of course, is trying to tell, is this real or is this not real? And so the whole idea of GANs is that these two networks essentially battle it out over time. Um, and this uh, came out in 2014 is when the uh, GANs were first introduced, as I recall. And, but they're super useful in things like image generation, video generation, uh, voice generation as well. So those, are the, those could be like the, sort of the positive examples, but we'll hear later on about the sort of the, the, the negative examples or risk, what we call deep fakes. So another thing that's really powerful in machine learning would be graph representations. So we've talked about CNNs or for spatial information, RNNs and transformers as well or for, for sequential uh, data. And, and we'll see later on uh, transformers can do images as well. But graphs, think about relationships. So things that aren't necessarily have a regular spatial structure, but about social networks, you can think about uh, biological information, so protein uh, structures and interconnections. So they're very, very um, uh, a flexible representation. And of course, graphs can change over time. You think about how um, the ownership company, uh, ownership structure of companies can change or social networks evolve over time. And so the bottom plot there kind of shows you have an existing network and then the idea is can we predict um will there be a new link so uh i'm mean, kind of curious can anyone think of an example of sort of the usefulness of link prediction or say social media any ideas telling you stuff yes absolutely so recommender systems also if you have a facebook account you have a set of friends and it has people you might know, right? Or Netflix, right? You've shown, <laughs> it knows what you've seen, but it also knows uh, basically what other the, uh, types of shows and movies people who are similar to you have seen. And so those are also examples of uh, graph representations where we can have things like link prediction. So to recommend friends or to recommend movies and Netflix. 
So graph neural networks are just basically a really, really uh, powerful adaptation of these graph representations, but neural networks uh, within that graph landscape. And so uh, really, really powerful stuff um, there. So just some examples of that, those references that Paco uh, Gradley, uh, kindly put together would be useful if you wanna go deeper into uh, GNNs. And then knowledge graphs, the idea is not only uh, basically having connection between entities, but also what are the types of attributes. So really, really a very, very, uh, think about when you're trying to create uh, uh, new chemicals, you have, you know, connections there, uh, protein connections is once again, a very, very super rich representation that's very, very powerful. So we've, now you've kind of like had a little like very rapid, let's see what time is it, 6.49. So super rapid, uh, you know, intro to AI, the kinds of neural networks that you see. So now we'll just talk about some potential areas. So reasoning and discovery, right? Think about, we already talked about product and media recommendations. So the whole Netflix example, uh, legal document assessment, financial uh, uh, asset management as well. You know, think about fraud detection, right? When uh, obviously, uh, when the credit card companies you're traveling, you have to, it has to very, very quickly make a determination in terms of like, is this purchase, does it fall within your regular or standard kind of purchasing uh, pattern? Or should we flag it as, uh, as fraud? Perception and communication. So predictive maintenance, inventory optimization, sales revenue. So lots of examples there. And then these, actually those, those titles should have been switched. Uh, this is for perception and recommendation. So autonomous vehicles, obviously self-driving cars. We'll talk about that more later. Voice recognition, right? So you say, hey Siri or hey Alexa, right? And then creativity and synthesis. So that's just kind of an example there of being able to generate text, being able to generate music or create new versions of uh, animation. So anyone, can anyone spot the fake and this. Well, the interesting thing is they're all fake. They are, these people do not exist. These are all these are all all fake, deep fakes, all generated. So that's the challenge. Uh, once again, it's kind of that uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in terms of the perils aspect. But these are all AI generated faces. Yeah. So as I mentioned, Transformers like totally has exploded. Well, sure enough someone has been able to adapt that transformer ar architecture that worked so well for natural language processing to vi vision as well. The idea is we just basically create little patches and it turns out that's a, that's a powerful enough representation. Once we have that representation, we can stuff it into that, uh, that transformer encoder and then make all kinds of predictions. And so, um, and even though they'll see that, paper, an image is worth six, 16 by 16 words. That paper came out, it was in 2000, and that one has already been cited by over 3000 papers. So that just gives you an idea of like how challenging it is to stay up on AI. I mean, no one person, like no one can, can keep up on everything, but the idea is like, if we can you know, keep track of these major trends, then we can uh, make the best of use of, of what's available. And so this goes back to what I said before. So CNNs typically had been used for image processing, image recognition. So now with, with vision transformers, so basically the, uh, the CNN based ones like ResNet and uh, those were all in purple. So basically the, as you move higher up, uh, the performance is better. And then the, the orange bubbles are the vision transformers. So we see here, just over the past uh, probably six months or maybe uh, maybe a little bit more there's an ongoing battle between cnns and vision transformers and we've seen this at our uh, kung fu ai uh, projects over the last three gosh right michael like at least three three or last three or four projects literally uh, we've been able to use both uh, versions of cnns and vision transformers in order to come up with the best results and and it's an ongoing battle so now here's one specific use case that I wanted to got to. This is one that we actually got to work, uh, uh, work on at Kung Fu AI. So DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, had a program called uh, Data-Driven Discovery of Models, or D3M. 
And the idea was, it was a very large program, like five years, a dozen companies, a dozen universities. And the, the idea was to create a very flexible system to uh, do automated machine learning and to make machine learning models understandable to non-experts or people who are experts in a particular field, but aren't necessarily machine learning experts. And we were part of a team led by Uncharted Software. And basically one of our big focus areas was something called remote sensing. So basically looking at satellite imagery. Um, and the idea here that we did, we've mentioned before, um, uh, supervised learning where we have all labeled examples, uh, unsupervised learning, and there's something called self-supervised learning. And that's basically where we try to pre-train a model with some representation of the data. So like, so that it can put similar images close together and different images far apart. That's called the sort of the pretext tax, uh, uh, pretext task. And then, but when, once you do that, once you have that representation, you can do things downstream tasks like image classification, like what kind of land is this? Is this urban? Is this agriculture? Uh, object detection, is that an airport there? Um, semantic segmentation, image retrieval, and so forth. So these are just, and change detection. So these are some of the, the applications. You can go to that website to see some more detailed examples. But the idea, one use case that we worked on at the end of this program uh, was uh, part of the FAO organization was in Africa, one of the challenges is food security. So because swarms of locusts, uh, when they get really massive, they can fly and they can destroy, destroy millions of tons of crops and, coup, and can cause uh, famine and starvation. And so the idea here is to try to classify what kind of land it is. Is it agricultural? So that's one piece is just doing that um, um, image classification piece and semantic segmentation. Where, where is the agricultural land? Then there are, there's an organization called the Locust Hub that actually goes out and monitors where locusts have been found. And they do that, I think it was like basically once a month at least. And we, the idea was then to train a machine learning model to keep track of where the locusts have been over time, and then to try to predict which crops are going to be uh, at risk. And so that was just an example where we got to use computer vision, use time series forecasting, and to then make this available within a, a machine learning, I'm sorry, within a, a broader user interface in order to combat these kinds of food security problems. All right, so, and once again, back to the fun, fun name examples, NERF, neural radiance fields, basically a new method for synthesizing novel views of complex 3D scenes using automatic unsupervised semantic scene decomposition. I'm gonna show, before we show the video, I'll just talk very briefly about the next slide. Oh, there you go. There we go. So basically the idea here is we are going to have this uh, 5D coordinate. We're gonna have a camera. So we'll have an X, Y, Z position and we'll be able to know which direction the camera, the virtual cameras is pointed in. So those are the, uh, those angular coordinates. And then we'll be able to create a representation of the scene. That's that F uh, value there. And the idea is then we wanna do ray tracing and figure out, okay, based on what we know about the scene to be able to create um, an RGB as well as RGB values as well as uh, transparency. So um, yeah, if you want, let's go ahead and uh, let's show that video, please. We present neural radiance fields or NERF, a new method for representing complex scenes that achieves state-of-the-art results for view synthesis. Given a set of input images of a scene, which in this visualization is a Lego bulldozer, we optimize a volumetric representation of the scene as a vector valued function, which is defined for any continuous 5D coordinate consisting of a location and view direction. We parameterize this scene representation as a fully connected deep network that takes each single 5D coordinate and outputs the corresponding volume density and view dependent emitted RGB radiance at that location. We can then use techniques from volume rendering to composite these values along a camera array 
to render any pixel. This rendering is fully differentiable, so we are able to optimize the scene representation by minimizing the error of rendering all camera rays from a collection of standard RGB images. We first show comparisons to top performing methods on synthetically rendered data. Scene representation networks implicitly represent a scene using a fully connected neural network. SRNs have issues with multi-view consistency and are unable to represent high frequency details. Local light field fusion uses a pre-trained network to promote each input view to a high resolution 3D volume. Inconsistencies between adjacent volumes causes flickering artifacts. Neural volumes encode a scene as a 128 cubed voxel grid and use a warp field to better allocate these limited samples. However, they're still unable to represent high resolution content, such as the fine details in the ship's texture and rigging. We see the same trend in all of our synthetic test scenes. Our method both qualitatively and quantitatively outperforms the other methods. Here we show the results of our method on the six other objects in our realistically rendered data set with complex geometry and non-Lambertian materials. Next, we will show comparisons on real scenes captured with a forward-facing phone camera. SRN uses a recurrent network to ray march through encoded scenes, resulting in inconsistent appearance between rendered views. LLFF blends between multiple renderings with different limited fields of view resulting in flickering artifacts along image borders. Here, only our method can represent fine details with complex occlusion effects, such as the ribs in this fossilized T-Rex skeleton. Great. Now let's take a look at some- I think we can stop there, that's good. Thank you. So that is NERV, so really, really cool. And once again, that's, uh, there are like multiple versions of, of uh, NERV that have come out since that, that original paper. Um, so COVID protein evolution prediction. So this is a really cool uh, example of basically using natural language processing kinds of techniques, but applying it to uh, basically to the COVID protein. So trying to predict which, um, which variants we're gonna be most threatening in terms of like uh, escaping the, the protective power of existing vaccines. And so it's really interesting that basically a lot of times the creativity comes in, how can we represent the data in such a way that we've already solved a problem for NLP, like looking beyond to define uh, semantic change. Well, it turns out the analogy for, uh, for viral escape is that kind of semantic change. So that's an example there, really cool. I, I wanna to say too, also using NLP, there, as, as we've seen, there are just tons and tons of papers that come out. As you can imagine, there have been thousands, tens of thousands of papers that have come out uh, around uh, about COVID-19. Uh, so Primer is a company that specializes in building these very complex NLP kind of models to understand documents in general. But if you go to this website, you can actually keep up on COVID research. Um, they go through, they summarize a lot of the papers. And so the idea here is once again, trying to use these NLP models to reduce, trying to aggregate lots of key results to find out which papers are most uh, uh, basically going viral in terms of the scientific community, because that way we can focus on the most important ones. So that's one uh, cool example. And so this one exam, uh, physical design using differentiable learned simulators. So this is this one falls more into the reinforcement learning plan. So I'll just kind of show you briefly and then we'll watch the video. So basically we want to, we have a design function. So for example, we might be trying to, to create a new aircraft wings. We're trying to figure out the correct shape. A design function will have simulators you run for the run the agents of the simulators, figure out how well it does, and that's the whole reward function piece. And then uh, basically do that until the, the model performs as well as we need it to. So yeah, John, if you don't mind, let's, uh, let's show that video. I don't think we have sound for this one, but... Uh, just kind of read along there. It's a lot of different applications here, designing tools, irrigation systems, but some very cool animations, I thought. Your 
find that design that design function, build a simulator. And that's an example where we're using these graph neural networks. You roll that forward and then we just evaluate that, that reward function. And then finally, once we do that, so it's really cool to see how we're able to use GNN simulators to represent really complex physical systems. So basically a combination of GNNs and physical simulations. So the alternative here in the past would have been more sampling based approaches and uh, the GNN plus the reward function does much, much better. 3D, that's that 3D water course. <laughs> You there's for two holes or so the this system does much much better. So it shows over time some model ensembles being used there. Well, cool. We can go ahead and stop there, but that's uh, thank you so much, John. So once again, the idea is that we can use these. Once again, it's about using the power of the representations in order to to solve these problems. In in a lot of cases, involving actual physical systems. Uh, and then speaking of physical systems, being a physicist, I when I saw the example, I had to bring it up. So once again, this is combining graph neural networks with some symbolic dynamics to try to rediscover physical laws. And in this case, obviously, we know what uh, Newton's uh, equations for, for gravitation are, but if you don't mind, let's take a look at the, the short little t video on that Twitter page. So here, it's a graph neural network where we have the edges that are basically representing the connections and the distances between each pair of planets in the solar system. Because we have that ground truth information, we can roll forward. It turns out that when you have the right, uh, right set of parameters, we do have to say, we have to, do, have to tell the system F equals MA, but it does much, much better than older, some just symbolic regression approaches. So anyway, I thought that was a really cool example of using graph neural networks to understand the way the solar system works. And basically it's able to figure out what the correct uh, symbolic, the whole symbolic expression there that uh, that bar with uh, number 13, they basically has the highest score that it basically figured out what the correct equation was. And so that's the symbolic representation piece. Uh, and then this was a really fun one. I think it only this one came out only last week. And once I have to give a huge uh, shout out to my friend and Kung Fu AI coworker, uh, Priya Joseph, who found this example. But the idea here is to combine and I'll show the next page. Um, to have a language model where you're trying to instruct a robot, uh, a robot to do something, but then we want to have uh, a way of representing how well a task could be completed within an environment. And so that's the whole value functions um, part. So figuring out what do you want to do, what the possibilities are, use a language model to predict that. Um, figure the, the robot can say, hey, what are the possible ways that I could solve what you, you're asking me to do, but then the value functions piece is basically figuring out what is actually possible within your environment. So John, I think this will be the last video.
spilled my Coke. How would you help me clean it up? And so using the language model, it's able to go through and figure out what are the options that it knows about, and then actually start completing the task. It doesn't quite get it in there, but <laughs> it tries hard. <laughs> But to clean it up, then you need the sponge. <laughs> Here you go. And then he lets the guy clean it up. <laughs> so it did pretty well. It did pretty well overall. So pretty really interesting combination, once again, of natural language with these kind of reward functions in order to, use, to solve these. Um, tell these this. So, you know, I thought I was like, and the cool thing is a lot of these examples came out either last week or within the last month. So lots of power, lots of potential. But of course, as we talked about before, it's really important to talk about the risks. So lots of areas of risk. You know, talk about security, privacy, fairness. There are lots of aspects of that that we'll talk about, bias and toxicity general ethical considerations that's a really interesting example there trying to explain uh the results or why a model is making its predictions <clears throat> one thing we won't go into detail but part of the challenges of these huge huge neural uh, huge models is that only the biggest companies you know the netflixes the facebook's the google's can afford to build them and in the course of doing that they use tons and tons of energy and so there's a trade-off in terms of like how big do you really need to go? And there's a whole field that uh, in machine learning that's geared towards pruning. It's like how small, once you figure out something that works well, great, now can you, pr can you uh, prune it down to something? And there are examples for uh, misinformation and disinformation we'll talk about. So obviously security and robustness uh, against adversarial attacks, we'll show an example here. We already talked about the risks of GANs and we'll show an example there. So physical adversarial patches. Uh, I don't know who figured out that you can actually print some of these uh, colored patches that will confuse the system. And I think people have done that even for uh, you know putting up these patches on uh, traffic signs, and it's enough to confuse self-driving cars. So there are definitely a lot of risks. Uh, deep fakes. We already talked about the whole the fact that you can. This was an example. So I've got a a friend and former uh, Yonder colleague, uh, Renee Risa, who's at Stanford, and somebody sent her a random LinkedIn uh, request. And so, and this, this article came out basically, that looks odd because the eyes were like completely centered and everything. And it turns out there's a whole set of companies who are creating fake le LinkedIn profiles with fake people. So once again, just good to be uh, cautious about that. So it's always an ongoing battle. So it, there are a lot of existing uh, tools that work well when you know what model they use to create the, the fake models. What happens if, uh, if you don't know or if there's a new model? And so this is a very recent, this came out just on March 26. And the I idea here is to use both local and uh, global features in order to find those differences it's always going to be an ongoing battle between uh, people who are trying to evade and you know, create fake things and, and folks uh, who are trying to find them. But this, this particular new approach looks particularly promising to me, so I wanted to highlight that. Obviously, we know the challenges. I hope, I'm sure a lot of folks have heard the challenges of uh, misinformation and disinformation, whether we're talking about election security, uh, election integrity, or obviously think about COVID and COVID vaccines. There was like very, very well documented examples of many, many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people uh, who died because they believed the, the false claims about vaccines. Um, there's a whole talk that I gave in May 2020, so there's not time for it, but if you want, there's a link. So I go into a lot of examples back from then, but I will highlight just, uh, just one example from May 2020 where this is in the early part of the pandemic, where many, many accounts were trying to claim that COVID was just the flu. And, uh, uh, and, and obviously, we, sadly, we've seen the, the effects of that kind of uh, 
uh, disinformation on uh, global health. More recently, and there's way more that I could show, but more recently, as you can imagine, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there's also lots of disinformation online here. Uh, you know, some examples here that these automated accounts in red, Russia never invaded Ukraine, the US backed a far right coup. So just a lot of uh, far right conspiracy theories that uh, sadly have uh, in some cases uh, taken, uh, taken hold. And so these are just among the, the I think I've found roughly 9,000 highly viral uh, accounts. See these examples of kind of the tweets that, that these accounts are are sending out. So once again, just the, the highlighting the, um, the, the need to be vigilant and to fight against uh, disinformation. So privacy considerations, whoa, we got really big things. We had a lot of, we had some challenges with bullets and the whole Google slide to PowerPoint uh, uh, conversion. But obviously the idea is that there's a trade-off between like these, um, basically the benefits that you get from training uh, models on more and more data, but the, the fact is that in a lot of cases, we, you know, data sources can be sensitive. Think about uh, healthcare data protected by HIPAA. So, but the cool thing is that there have been a lot of uh, advances in terms of privacy pre preserving deep learning. So this, uh, this approach uh, here that I uh, cite from 2016, basically the idea is you break up your data set, you create little uh, I'm sorry, you create individual teacher models based on subsets of the data. So you get predictions from those, and then you have a student model that basically learns from the individual teacher models. But the idea is you inject, you inject enough noise when you aggregate the results uh, of all the teacher models to the student. So that way you can guarantee that uh, you can never go back and recover the original sensitive data. So that's the whole area of federated learning and um, privacy preserving or differential privacy. It's really, really important stuff. And I'm excited that actually currently at Kung Fu, we're getting to work on a breast, a breast cancer detection a project for clarity. And, um, and the fact is it's, it's a re really been a great example of getting to now move into this area of federated learning. So fairness considerations. Uh, obviously, there's a huge, I mean, that, that in itself is, is, is a talk. In fact, there, there are conferences just for that. So, but you can have an idea for group fairness. Is one group being treated equally fairly compared to another group? Individual fairness. And are, are you talking about process? Is the way you arrived at the decision fair or was the outcome? And these are, you can think about really, really important things like college admissions, mortgage lending decisions, and credit ratings. Obviously, are, these are all examples where the results of machine learning uh, systems have a profound impact on, on people's lives. So it's really important to be able to understand a lot of those considerations. Bias, lots of just uh, show you just lots of different kinds of bias you have to take uh, into account. And I think broadly, it just means that we have to be a lot more aware of not only the environment of the problem you're trying to solve, the people who, who would be potentially affected, uh, and the fact that we will all have our internal biases. And so another important thing is just to have a very broad set of stakeholders. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Uh, bias in healthcare models, actually that goes back to the breast cancer detection. So what we're tending to see, and this, uh, this example here, is that certain uh, racial groups some of them are more well represented, right? Because maybe they're come from a wealthier company countries. And so there are lots of training examples. And so, and so less uh, advantaged groups, there aren't as many examples. And so typically uh, the models don't do as well because they haven't been shown as many examples. So once again, that's just real, just reemphasizes the point that taking these considerations into mind when building systems is very important. Um, so obviously we talked about the challenges of deep fakes for language models, I'm sorry, for, uh, for vi you know, visual representations, but the same thing can happen for these uh, large language models that learn how, how speech is. Well, you know, a lot of them were trained on the internet, which is, as you know, uh, <laughs> a very challenging place with lots of toxic and hateful and uh, racial content. And unfortunately, that's, those are kind of the risks. Uh, so you have to really, really take that in mind. 
So there are some uh, open source fairness tools. There's I one from IBM called the INEA Fairness 360, just as a way of like, as when you're building a model to try to take into account uh, how fair is, is this representation, trying to, to check that along the way while you're training and then trying to mitigate it down the road. And then Google also really released another one called uh, the ML Fairness Gym. And the idea here is that as things change over time, you know, you don't release one version of a model. It's going to change over time. And so it's really important to be able to keep up with it to make sure that maybe something happens in the world and now this original model would start uh, mistreating some groups. Okay, so here's really, it's, so sometimes it's not about the, the algorithms necessarily themselves. It's about the sort of moral issues. So this one comes from ethics and autonomous vehicles autonomous vehicles. So for example, if uh, a collision is unavoidable and you have various sets of, you know, the car would have to decide what to do. So whom do you, um, whom do you spare? Do you spare the driver? Do you spare pedestrians? Or maybe can the car figure out, are these children, right? Well, it turns out that this, this whole, uh, I encourage you to check out this nature article because it turns out that these moral considerations are different in different countries, in different, they reflect cultural values. So once again, this really kind of emphasizes the fact that it's not just about the data, it's not just about the algorithms, it's about the overall, the overarching uh, environment of, of human life. So geared towards that, there's been a lot of, fortunately, a lot of advances in what we call algorithmic accountability. There was a paper that came out early in uh, January, 2020, between Google and the partnership and AI in this whole framework, trying to basically build a, a framework to take in, into account just tons and tons of these issues. The idea like at the beginning, we want to do use case ethics review. We actually do that at Kung Fu. We have an ethics we meeting every Wednesday. And if there are potential projects that, that are where there are ethical concerns, we do an ethics review. And even if we decide to move forward with a project, we want to make sure that we take ethics into account the whole way through. And um, uh, I just think it's really, really important things like model cards to document how was this model trained, data sheets. If, there, if the model was trained on certain data sets, how was the data collected, right? If there were uh, you know, a possibilities of uh, bias in the data set, how do you mitigate that? So it's not like uh, none of these things are perfect solutions, but it's just a way of trying to get the best possible solutions. <clears throat> and I thought this was a great quote. I'll just let you all read it for a second, but, uh, and it really kind of speaks to the, the, the emphasis on it being not just about the algorithms, but about looking at the power structures within the system and who, who would be affected by these systems. So regulation. So once again, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of changes. The, the Federal Trade Commission now uh, has started to move into uh, basically saying, if you, well, companies, if you are using an AI algorithm, that you need to be able to show uh, that it was fair, that it's not biased. Um, and I think that's especially that's particularly in Europe, there there are even more uh, kind of advances there. And so that's something just really to keep in mind. So the good news is that there are just tons and tons of resources. So uh, Tina, this, this one is a shout out to you. So thanks, Tina, who's sitting over here. She did our, uh, her capstone project with Kung Fu AI. There's a whole responsible AI community portal. So really, really great set of resources you can find about companies, frameworks. So if you're interested in this, I definitely encourage you to, to check that out. And so just by, by way of resources. So first of all, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are very passionate about AI for good efforts at Kung Fu AI. So especially if you're a nonprofit or some kind of a community led organization uh, that would need help with AI, but wouldn't necessarily be able to hire uh, a machine learning firm, I would definitely encourage you to reach out. Just email us at info at kungfu.ai. So as I mentioned, data.world, I'm very, uh, very proud of them. Um, they actually do a lot of work in terms of public data for social good. They have the whole COVID-19 resource hub. And uh, 
you know, they have examples around policing in America, so it's a way of sharing data for these important considerations. And then healthcare pricing, obviously that's something where uh, that can affect lots and lots of people. So data.world, you can create an account for free. If you publish a data set that's gonna be broadly available, that's all for free as well. I think, yeah, th these are just, uh, we're towards the end here. So if you're interested in going much deeper, looking at the industry or these societal uh, implications, I really, really encourage you to check out the State of AI report from Nathan Benach and Ian Horgoth. Uh, Stanford produces an AI index report every year that's really, really awesome. Montreal Ethics uh, is really well known in this space as well. And I uh, definitely want to call out, uh, give a shout out to my friend and our advisor, Paco Nathan, uh, he just did a, a industry survey analysis. Obviously, AI and healthcare is really important, lots of potential benefits, but some challenges as well. So he just uh, uh, re released that just yesterday. And then papers with code, if you want to go deep into what's like absolutely latest and greatest in AI, I definitely recommend that you check out papers with code. So there we go. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so you got a big overview today of AI. This is going to be AI month. We have a lot of different kinds of activities for AI April with the Austin Forum. Some of them are just discussion oriented. One is a, a workshop. We'll talk about those coming up. But I know you probably have a few questions here about uh, tonight's event. So I want to introduce our managing director for the Austin Forum, Heather Bishop, who's going to select a few of those questions, including one that will win a South by Southwest badge. So please welcome Heather. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Steve, Dr. Steve. Absolutely, you're welcome. All right, so I do have a few questions here. Let's see. All right, this question comes from J. Craig Wheeler. What do you think about the prospects of no-code AI where easy-click GUI techniques make AI accessible to average people? Um, let's see, well, first example, that DARPA D3M program that I mentioned is really geared towards exactly that. And there are a bunch of uh, commercial platform companies that are really geared towards that. Um, so I think that in a lot of cases that, yeah, part of it depends on how complex the problem is that you're trying to solve. But there, broadly speaking, there are a bunch of solutions for what we call auto ML. And so depending on how hard or easy your problem is, there are lots of good solutions out there. That sounds good, very practical. Mm -hmm. All right, this question comes from John Thurer. What is your view on deep learning interpretability if it is successful, if it is a valuable direction of research? Well, I, I definitely agree that it's a valuable direction of research. Um, what we're tending to see that is that different classes of deep learning models are some are harder and some are easier to interpret. So for example, when we looked at the example of the transformer models, where you were able to go back to essentially look at the weights of the individual tokens, that one is a lot easier to do than for say, some of the, the traditional vision models like CNNs. But there is a lot of research going into, um, into interpretability. I mean, I don't think deep learning methods in general will ever be as interpretable as classical method like decision trees, uh, but there's definitely progress there. All right, that makes a lot of sense. This question comes from Jody Slagle. How did your background in chaos theory inform your work in AI? <laughs> well, the cool thing is that a lot of the techniques that, that, we, uh, that we talked about for both for classical machine learning as well as deep learning, uh, a lot of the, the math that's underlying them is very much the same. So there's a lot of, there are many synergies among physics, math, computer science, statistics, and sort of those, those underlying transformations and matrices, um, it just it is similar language, the underlying math. All very similar then, all right. 
Let's see here. I'm saving that. You touched on this earlier, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it back. David Ockel, Ockel? I'm not sure how I'm pronouncing that, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The European Union, amongst others, is working on regulating the use of AI in safety and privacy-related contexts, as in, you need to be able to describe how your algorithms work and how they come to conclusions so that we can be sure that undesired outcomes will be avoided. What is your take on this and how it will influence innovation and the adoption of AI? Well, hopefully, as you saw from that whole kind of like the last quarter of the, of the talk is like, it's super important. <laughs> there are lots of new frameworks. It's definitely a challenge for deep learning systems, but that doesn't mean that we should we should stop or shy away from it. I think probably what's most important is to focus our efforts on how to put it, like errors in self-driving driving cars are way more important than, oh, I showed you a less optimal Netflix recommendation, right? Looking at that the negative harm, right? <laughs> Do you think that it will actually push innovation? Oh, I think so, okay. right? Especially because, well, especially now, I think with the FTC, like being able to find companies, like there will be economic uh, consequences because <laughs> they'll need- Incentives, to. actually. Yeah, actual incentives. Makes sense. All right. This question comes from Brittany Glassroder. What is one advancement in AI you expect to see by the end of the year that you are most excited about? Well, I'm not sure, like, but I, uh, the, 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 that, that uh, robot example, the say I can, like that one stands out. It's, it's so fresh in mind. I'm really curious to see how far people could go uh, in that area. Nice. This question comes from John Lockman who I know and therefore cannot uh, make my favorite question. The EU just approved an AI x-ray assistant. This is, I happen to be a huge fan of radiology, so I also have an invested interest in this. What are the barriers to adoption of medical AI in the US? Yeah, of medical AI in the US. Um, obviously, uh, FTA approval is a big hurdle. I mean, that's actually something that our, our uh, client Clarity is going through right now. So obviously, once again, it comes down to uh, the risk of negative, uh, negative outcomes or harm. So I think that those are kind of the, the, the biggest hurdles right there. All right, and, oh goodness. This comes from Hayden. I'm sorry in advance about my pronunciation of your last name, Hayden. Um, Patronite. One of the promises of AI is taking repetitive tasks out of human hands, freeing us up to pursue other more human-specific activities. What are some examples of where that promise has been realized? Who benefited and who perhaps may have been disadvantaged? Well, I think the, fa the easy example that I think of is if you have a smartphone, you're ben benefiting from AI, right? So obviously Since. the fact you can say, hey Siri, Right, you can talk to the phone. Um, so people who would not be advantaged, like obviously people who can't, who don't have the don't have them means to 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 benefit from that. All right, and now I'm going to ask my favorite question. <laughs> this question comes from Max P. It's a very practical, industry-related question. I used to be confident that as a software engineer. My job might be pretty secure. I also used to think that creative fields were safe from automation. However, recent developments such as OpenAI's Codex, AI-generated code, and DALL-E, text-to-image art generation, has now made me rethink that. What fields, jobs, if any, might be impossible to replace with AI, and how do we prepare for the mass AI job automation? Hmm. Well, that's a that's a big one. I that's, I'm really that's <laughs> I, I mean, my apologies. I guess, yeah, I mean, my, my I guess my hope would be that we can focus uh, the development of AI machine learning to handle a lot of the repetitive tasks. And and obviously there are lots of examples where people where systems have done exactly that. 
that have automated a lot of, the, you know, think about like uh, just examples of like summarizing documents, make it easier to, uh, the same thing happens. Uh, we have a healthcare client IDN software where we're trying to go through and understand uh, physician's notes and try to summarize those, make sure things are pro properly categorized. Um, and so, but I think that there, I mean, fundamentally, I always believe that human creativity uh, is going to be super important. And to the extent that we can gear the development of AI systems in order to allow people more time to focus on those kinds of endeavors. I mean, I think humans are always evolving. And so I think we'll always find uh, creative things to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Steve Kramer and Jay Boisseau. I'm going to bring you back up. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.